everyone, Richard Carlton here. Welcome to another awesome day of FileMaker training. I'm here at our Fairfield headquarters where we're going to be doing some internet adjustments a little bit. What I'm going to do is I'm going to, today is an interesting conversation. I want to engage all of you as your personal experience. Now, some of you don't have experience in this. Some of you do have experience. Like Michael doesn't, Michael's fairly new. He's been doing FileMaker for a year. That qualifies him to know absolutely zero about the topic. But if I need someone to sacrifice themselves on the altar of a demo or something today, he's ready to help us take one for the team. Right, Michael? Right? <laughs> yes, sir. Today's conversation is both kind of a junior thing that you should learn. So Michael will be learning this. It's more of advanced conversation, your experience. And I originally uh, uh, recorded videos on this about five years ago, and it's called Directed Workflow. Now, I, and, the, and the short version is, is that in a very simplified way, we're going to tightly control what the user does as opposed to giving them unlimited control in their custom application. It's not even really a FileMaker issue. It's, it's a, we built software issue. The question is, how do we manage them and what do we do, right? And, and what was happening since that time, I've done a lot of, um, I do some, I read some biographies and autobiographies, not autobiographies, biographies. And Walter Isaacson did one on Steve Jobs that I've gone through two or three times now. And every time I read or I actually listen to an audio book, I come up with revelations. Because what I find myself is I listen to a book, I hear a profound sentence. And I'm not a very bright guy. I'm, I'm not very sharp. And so someone says something profound to me. And, I, and, I, and, I, and what I do is I, my brain disconnects all the audio and hopefully not the video, but the video audio disconnects, and I'm processing the significant meaning of the sentence, and then the following couple sentences that come out, I don't hear them at all. They're like totally lost. So sometimes you have to watch or listen to things a couple times to fully grasp the material. <clears throat> and so what we have is I'm going to go over here uh, to the concept of directed workflow. Let me just, I, I, I've, I've got little bits and pieces all over that where we're talking about this today. So today we're talking about directed workflow. I have exactly two whole slides here. I'm going to put them over Michael's head. We don't really need to see Michael. Michael's not important. Right, Michael? Smile. Yes, sir. All right, good. He takes, take one for, there's the first one for the team right there. So, uh, <laughs> Directed workflow is the idea that in a process, we're going to specifically direct people linearly through a explicit process. And the process might fork, but it's not like the open-ended kind of experience. So let's talk about this. So what used to be directed workflow was great for managing limited screen, screen real estate. So a smaller mobile device, right? with a phone, right? So here's your magical phone. Can't hardly see it. Let me turn it on a little bit. Here's your magical phone. It has a much smaller screen on it. And so how you let people interact with your custom app in that device is different than how they would interact with a, probably a laptop slash iPad, full-size iPad. It's like that 10-inch, 12-inch, 13, 14-inch screen versus the command base where you have multiple monitors here and there's 24 inches and 35 inches and all sorts of different size monitors. So but really, it becomes a real when you have a tiny screen like this, or if you're trying to do it on a watch, right? You know, the, the Apple Watch, which I don't use because I refuse to charge my watch every 18 hours or 12 hours or 5 hours or whatever it is. The smaller the screen gets, the more clever you have to do in, in delivering the user interface. And basically, you have to start chopping elements out. And so let's talk about this basically. So what, what, I, what, what, what my hypothesis is, I'm giving you a hypothesis, this is my theory, Richard's theory, okay? It used to be purely about uh, compensate for uh, screen, small screen devices or for users who, who don't want to follow the needed process. And this is what came up with something with jobs, and it came up with something um, that one of my engineers said, so I'll tell you this story. So let's talk about, um, so directed workflow is uh, the idea, let me go over to my QuickTime video here real quick. And if we have questions, Margaret, you need to engage with me on the questions, right? Uh, yes, I'm going to pop over here. I'm going to pop this up. The audio is off. So what I'm going to do, this is from the video training that you folks have. If you bought the complete or video set training, this is out of our mobile course. We talk about Go. We talk about this a little bit. And the idea is that as a process um, evolves, like your business process, you're going to navigate people through the screens, right? Very specific screens. Uh, so this process, so for example, in this situation, we have a business process where uh, 
a customer calls, right? And somehow the customer wants to hire you, and and then then you log the time on the project. This would be maybe like a, a maybe even a project manager or something like that. And then you bill against the time. And so there's this entire process that goes on. It's a business process that is established. It doesn't matter. It's business. It could be a nonprofit. Could be organization. It could be government. I would hope the government would have processes like this. Sometimes you wonder if they have any process at all. Depends on what government surround you. But yeah, I mean, it's like you know how you do things, right? Beginning to end, right? You're going to have a requisition. You're going to do a PO. The product will be delivered. Then you'll turn the PO in, and the PO will be delivered. I mean, there's business processes that go on. And so what happens is, is that it becomes an issue of trying to manage that on the phone. You also have people who will circumvent the process. So it's a second item. So what I'm going to do is the issue, the two issues come up, and that is, is that here, here's the idea. If you have, um, actually, let me just go through it in the video here. Instead of me demoing, it's just better to show the video because we've already animated this. So that, so there's this workflow process. So over here, we have this small screen. This would be like a, a screen out of, uh, out of FileMaker out of uh, st one of the starting points, the older ones. And, uh, or actually probably starting point 20 is in here. And the idea is that you can jump around and do different things on the interface, right? So, you, but the idea is that there's this directed workflow where we want to direct people through a specific process. Well, if I pop to the next video, we talk about this a little bit. Um, I'm just using this for animation purposes, right? So um, this is an important understanding is that with smaller, especially with smaller screens, if you build a FileMaker solution, 80% of the customers are only going to use 20% of the features, right? This is this 80-20 rule. It's, it's, the numbers aren't exact business to business, but generally there's a big giant ratio of most, a vast majority of your customers will only use a small slice of those features. Those small slice of features are what you're going to want to figure out how to manage on your mobile device, right? Pretty straightforward. Um, you're like, oh, okay, that's really common sense, right? So what I'm going to do, this is, uh, so I've logged in. This is a copy of starting point 20 over here. It's on the iPad. But the point is, it's kind of open-ended, right? You can go anywhere and press any button at any position, right? And so there's this is what we call decidedly not directed or non-directed workflow. The, it's up to the user, the person who's using the FileMaker solution, to decide where they're going to go to put the data in to follow the business processes on their own. So one, they have a large enough screen that they're able to show them a lot of stuff. And two, that gives them the opportunity to give them the freedom or flexibility that they might desire or might need. I frequently like to treat people, it's always a good rule management, treat people the way you want to be treated, except that sometimes doesn't work. Right, and I'm not telling you to be mean to people, but like in the in the world of FileMaker, we want unlimited scripts with unlimited flexibility. That's why we like the Monkey Bread plugin so much because it gives us all this other stuff that we can have that FileMaker won't give us. And so we want unlimited everywhere. But some people with great power comes great responsibilities, like that old Spider-Man quote, right? I think that was from Spider-Man Marvel Universe. And so you have people where you give them the unlimited interface and where directed workflow is this process where someone goes A, B, C, you know, you get something like A, B, C, and D, and E, and they're and they're all over the place what they're doing. They're jumping here, they're jumping there, they're jumping everywhere. They're not completing the process. They may not complete the process in a way that's beneficial for the business. Beneficial for the business. And so directed workflow, you can use it for two different reasons. Mostly, so like when you're checking out, like you're, I just, I just bought some new business cards uh, an hour and a half ago, and you go through the process of checking out, and so you're, you're shopping around, you're doing this kind of wherever kind of experience all over the website, but then you get the part where you have to check out. So it's, you, have, you have to identify, confirm this is the order you want. Yes, it is. Then sequentially go through, provide your billing information, provide your shipping information, finally confirm the order, you're done, and it's like bang, 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 bang. Your specific processes, steep. Um, you're going to run into people and customers who cannot follow uh, business processes or they don't want to follow business processes. And this is where it gets back to part of a Steve Jobs interview. I'm going to pop this up. This is an hour and a half interview that almost no one has seen. It was found. It's a, it's a VHS copy of a tape from a three-quarter inch Betamax that was lost 
years ago. This is right before Jobs was hired. He came back to Apple the second time. He was at Next. And there's part of, part of this interview, it actually talks really about the management team at Claris, which is kind of funny. Uh, it's like, oh, my gosh, they're really talking about <laughs> people. But in, in this part specifically, we're talking about customers who don't behave in your database, right? And so let me play this for you. It's about two minutes, so you can pick this up. You know, throughout the years in business, I found something, which was I'd always ask why you do things. And the answers you invariably get are, oh, that's just the way it's done. Nobody knows why they do what they do. Nobody thinks about things very deeply in business. That's what I found. So I'll give you an example. Um, when we were building our Apple Ones in the garage, we knew exactly what they cost. Uh, when we got into a factory in the Apple II days, um, the accounting had this notion of a standard cost, where you'd kind of set a standard cost, and then at the end of a quarter, you'd adjust it with a variance. And I kept asking, well, why do we do this? And the answer was, well, that's just the way it's done. And, and after about six months of digging into this, what I realized was the reason you do it is because you don't really have good enough controls to know how much it costs. So you guess, and then you fix your guess at the end of the quarter. And the reason you don't know how much it costs is because your information systems aren't good enough. So, but nobody said it that way. And so later on, when we designed this automated factory for Macintosh, we were able to get rid of a lot of these antiquated concepts and know exactly what something cost to the second. Um, so, in business, a lot of things are, I, I call it folklore. They're done because they were done yesterday and the day before. And so what that means is, is if you're willing to sort of ask a lot of questions and think about things and work really hard, you, you can learn business pretty fast. It's not the hardest thing in the world. So yeah, so he's talking about, they were, they were like talking about, well, you're 20 some odd years old and how'd you learn business? And he's trying to explain that, well, it's not that hard if you ask questions. And so. The other day I had an engineer who was telling me about, he has a, a senior engineer, works part-time with this uh, fairly big company, and they, they're in agriculture. They harvest, um, they harvest uh, crops. Just, I'm going to leave it sufficiently loose so we don't know who we're talking about. They harvest crops. They're a big company. They're using FileMaker. And we were interacting with a manager who was down there who 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 had implemented some business processes and they had a problem where the data would get not really not corrupted like the databases broke like you crashed it and didn't fix it but like people are putting data in the bad spot the data integrity is bad like like and what would happen is that they found out that they had these uh, and it turns out to be some ladies in the front office it could be guys it doesn't matter what they are but people in the front office and what they would do is that uh is that every year they would do things like, oh, we're going to shut the file down, duplicate it, and create a new file for the new year. And if they had like an order that would come in, they would work out the order, print it out, and then they would, uh, if they had a new order for these XYZ uh, agricultural products would come in, they would use the same record and put, and then change the data. Not even with the same customer, it's a different customer, but we don't want to create a new record. So they would always be changing the ID on the on the record and we asked well why are you doing it that way and they said well that's the way we always did it and the gal's been there 20 plus years and so they they had a boss in there that we were working with and he'd enforce some rules where you're going to follow this process we've given you a process you like your job you want to be employed here we value you but you need to follow the rules so this rule is you're going to create a new record well that guy moves on out to a different company the guy the person that's underneath him comes up and then a week later, we start getting data integrity issues. And what it was is that the ladies that had been there for now 25 or 30 years were like, oh, that guy who made us do it the hard way is gone. We're going to go back and do it the old way, which provided, destroyed the data, provided no historical knowledge, no integrity, and they don't give a <laughs> These people doing the data entry do not give a <laughs> The managers in the company know that their data now is not accurate. They go back to the file guy and say, hey, you suck as a developer. As a developer, you are a bad developer because the data is inaccurate. So we investigate. We find out, oh, this lady changed this data, right? Why would you change it? Well, 
It's the way we used to do it, and that jerk boss that we had who now quit left so we could go back and do it the old way. Now, Jobs has talked about this. I just saw this last week. So my question to my engineer, and I haven't really asked the question because it's up to the customer and the engineer to have this conversation, is that if you've got belligerent staff, you need to narrow down their business process. Clearly, you have given them an interface like FM Starting Point which allows them uh, to go anywhere and do and click on anything and do anything the way they want, including changing the invoice number. Go up here and change the invoice number. Change the primary keys. Change things that should be locked down. And so this is not directed workflow as opposed to a specific linear process, a specific linear process. Step one, phone call comes in. I have to go over here. I created this for my sales guy. For my sales guy, uh, when if you get a call from Ryan, he might be be winging it, but he's supposed to be following it in his system. In fact, we should go and do that. See if we can find that. Uh, let me do this real quick. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go. I'm going to we're going to review a modern day finish good system. If you see any confidential information here, please don't stare at it. Let me take a look at this. What I want to do is I want to go to preferences here. And I want to turn on sales mode, yes and yes. I'm going to go to contacts. And so now we're in the sales mode for the sales guy. It's a little busy. but So what we did is the sales guy was classic. And I'm, and I'm talking about him behind his back, but he, I'm, not going to, I'm not being mean, but the sales guy doesn't give a shit about the process. He doesn't give a shit about anything except making the sale. That's the way salespeople are. Okay? And I'm not picking on them. They have a very important role in the company, our company, any company, to sell the product. But they don't really care about the process on the back end. And we need the process, right? Because it gives us a really good history. Uh, and, we, and, and, he go, and if I say, well, don't you need to know the history? Oh, I remember it. Well, he kind of does and kind of doesn't. So we build this directed workflow. We say, begin new touch. And here is the directed workflow. Can we see this, everyone? Right? I'm going to zoom in on this a little bit. Right? So... Are you responding? It's so it's linear. Do this. You don't get the whole starting point interface. Do this. Do the other thing. Uh, we're initiating a chat. Okay. I'm going to press initiate. And then it shows them, well, you had this call this day. Then day three, you had this call. So now you should be doing this other thing, right? And so, so pick one. So it says pick one. You don't give a choice. You don't get to make it up. Pick one, right? I'm going to make a phone call. Okay. Then you come over here. Okay, and these are all the common things that happen. The phone is just connected, no answer, left voicemail, person left the company, doesn't use file making anymore, per person would rather, whatever. This is the linear process you force them to follow. Because a lot of people won't follow the process if you turn their back on them, right? And do you really want to fire someone that you've trained, that you've gone through this process? Well, yeah, if they're in the military and they're a shooter and they're on an entry team with you and they're the guy on your left, yeah, you really want them to follow the rules and sweep their zone as you go through a door. You're going to go from 12 o'clock to 2 o'clock. This guy's going to go left from 11 o'clock to 10 o'clock, right? And the guy behind them is going to peel off. So as you do a train entry and a door, you go through it the correct way. Well, you can't have the guy going, it. I'm just going to look around and shoot whoever I feel like it. Everyone's got a job. Your life depends upon, I get that. But we're not talking about that in this situation. We're talking about people typing on their computer and interacting and doing some job. Uh, so anyway, so there's this process here. Pro five person, uh, this is a test record here. Uh, phone is disconnected, so you put the thing in here. It pre kind of formats a note over here. No answer. So then what it does allows him to put some notes in here, put some notes in here, confirm the phone call, and then it's kind of done. And then it sends them to a spot where they can issue a follow-up email. So we have this step-by-step-by-step -by -step -by -step linear process. It, it, it's like backwards, and then forward is you have to pick something over here. Skip follow-up email. <laughs> There you go. You have chosen to take action that, that is in direct violation of the rules. If something goes wrong, the boss will be very angry and you will be blamed for everything and fired as soon as possible. That's not true, but I, I try to get the attention of the staff, right? So there you go. So skip the email. Uh, like, never mind, skip it, right? So, uh, yeah, and it logs the fact that you've skipped the follow up email, right? 
but maybe if the person's gone from the company or whatever, it would make sense that you would skip the email. So there might be a time where you really needed to do that. So then you finish the process. So it's a linear process. Ding, 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 right? Linear process. Why do you need this? Either people don't want to follow the process and you really need them to follow the process and you can't fire them very easily or do you really want to fire them? Or maybe a, a lot of times you have good people, a little encouragement along the right way is enough to get them to go along with the program. Once again, I'm not talking about making, uh, pieing the entry through a doorway, okay, with a M4, right? I'm not talking about that. I'm talking <laughs> about um, people who are in the, you know, REMFs, right, for Stu. I don't know what you call them in the in the in the Marines or in the Navy, but REMFs, right? Uh, the people in the back office who do paperwork, right, etc. So um, yeah, it's kind of important. My my job is not to teach you how to do FileMaker; it's to get you thinking about ways of managing people. Um, and because if you just tell someone to go in a room and behave themselves, half the time they're not going to do that. They just don't. Uh, you have an expectation that they will fill out a database a certain way or and I, I mean we used to have uh, customers who they end up screw I think they end up going out of business but they would be in a contact record like this and they would have a phone call so they would put a date here and then they would log the fact that there was a phone call here and then and then and then there would be another phone call over here and then another date where they're like okay it was 3 1 20 21 right and there'd be another note and all the notes are just spewed all over. In it, cause if there was a box they could type in, they would type in there and just type it. I mean, and so partly when your customers misbehave, you have to look objectively at their workflow. And are you making the poodle jump through flaming hoops, right? Is like the you know the flaming you know, is like the circus. You got poodles, a dog, and there's a hoop, and it's on fire. The dogs don't want to do that. So the question is, is um, are you making them jump through flaming hoops unnecessarily? You want to make it as simple as possible, right? And that's such an operative, important thing in the world of software design. Uh, make make the cogn co uh, cognitive realities, the difficulties of it, as minimal as possible, as intuitive as possible, right? Which, in the case of like Nick, I have to tell Nick to label your damn fields, right? Put labels on them because if you put phone field, cell phone field, mobile phone, and then home phone field, and you don't put labels on them because Apple doesn't label them because that would be a waste of, you know, electrons or something. And then you put date phones in there, you have no idea what they are or not are, right? And you could put an inline label in them, which is great, but then if you have three phones in there, you really don't know which one's which. And so that's an unnecessary cognitive thing that I and Nick would argue about. Um, and so... Uh, yeah, that's an important thing. So comments, questions over here. Bob says employees tend to do what you inspect. Inspect. Okay, let's jump over here. I'm going to jump to Discord real quick because this is some juicy stuff over here. Uh, let me go to the conversation. So scrolling down. So Bob says, yeah, they tend to do what you, what you inspect, not what, what they expect. NJ, are there any good examples of workflow, workflow chart process to FileMaker finish design? Workflow. Okay, so we're talking about workflow within an organization, not how to build a, an application, NJ, right? I, 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 we're talking about business processes to build a business process. The, 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 the thing that I, I mean, there are companies that try to processize the FileMaker development process. So Lion is one, Codens is another one, and they, they work under some circumstances. Some circumstances, people hate it. So it's kind of a mixed bag of success and fail. But the idea is to try to make it such a, no matter what you put in the top of the machine, the gears turn and out comes kind of this process. Except sometimes that process isn't what people really want. It's kind of a hit and miss situation. Before the companies tend to use, are you talking about flow chart? Pro, you're talking about actually yeah. charting, charting, like a chart chart? Oh, um, Google has some charts on this. I, I tend to want to use Fusion charts just because their stuff is so much better. Uh, the free stuff is Google charts. But if you go to Fusion, I kind of like these guys. Fusion chart charts. Let's try Fusion charts. Do, 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 do. Oh, these companies are competing against them. Yeah, they, they have a pretty, uh, we used to do a lot of demos on this. In fact, we have some demos on it. 
Uh, you come over here and uh, products. Uh, let's see, charts, galleries, maps, galleries, time gallery, feature galleries. So I'm just like scrolling through here. There's dashboards and all this stuff you just load up into a, a, a value list, either with uh, probably JSON these days or JSON is, is if Kyle's here. Uh, Kyle is not here, so it's JSON today. Uh, so here's a, a, a skanky, no, not skanky. Okay, <laughs> I saw this. I thought this was a skanky diagram. That is not a skanky diagram. That's a sankey diagram. I'm not sure what the difference a skanky and sankey is, but there you go. So stock diagrams. Uh, yeah, my dad's calling me and I'm on live TV. That's great. I've told him a hundred times. He's, <laughs> the problem is he's retired and he doesn't give a shit anymore. Imagine me with 25 more years of belligerence in me, and then that would be my dad. It's like, wow. Uh, where would I find um, org charts? Ex ex what's extensions? Accessibility. Oh, that's that. Integrations. Yep. Uh, chart guides. Feature area. Okay. Uh, no, I had the galleries before. I like the galleries. Fusion maps. Let me see. Fusion maps examples all right so yeah there's all sorts of maps that's Europe so they got all these uh, where did, where'd that overview charts overview hmm I, I kind of screwed that up I need to see the gallery time series gallery it was time look at the time series gallery okay, there's that oh that's just kind of a uh, line charts multivariate charts let me zoom in over here a little bit on this so you folks can see this I'll make this bigger all right, so yeah, so it's uh, line charts. This is like if you went to engineering in college or you're a statistics student, you've seen this kind of stuff before. Uh, I'm looking, there are org charts out there you can program into and they can uh, process that out. I would dig through here until you found what you were looking for. Uh, integrations, features, time series, charts, and maps gallery. So let me just go through this to the bottom, top to bottom. There's like a little, and then up. Oh, here we go. Up. Oh, there we go. Gra no, no, there it is. Probably something like this, because you could. Up. Oh, there we go. Ah. There we go. So dr drag node charts, whatever these are. So clearly, these are charts that would allow you to do what you want to do. Yes. I don't use C3, so I can't answer the question. I just know that I present on Fusion Charts back at DEF CON like 20 years ago. They've been around a long time. It used to be, it used to be in Flash, all the Flash code, right, from uh, Adobe, and then Flash went away. So then it was all JSON and JavaScript. So that's the way it works now. So you'll have to investigate. Yep. Question from YouTube. Timothy, when do you get in... When you get into real estate, what are the, the recommendations for approaches to put what where? It's not so much uh, directed workflow on the real estate side, once again, is not so much, um, it's not so much where you put where. I mean, I guess, okay, so there's this thing called Apple Human Interface Guidelines. If you if you want to look at that, Apple, I get just type pig, hopefully that'll work. Ah, there you go, Apple Human Interface Guidelines. I highly recommend you check this out. Uh, Google has one of these too. I tend to go with what Apple says because they tend to be a little bit better about it. And so they talk about uh, interface guidelines and things like that, clarity, deference, depth, all this sort of stuff, spending some time in this. It basically uh, teaches you quite a bit, um, uh, providing a launch screen, launch screen orientation, adaptability, things like that, onboarding, right, things like this. Um, directed workflow isn't so precise as telling you where to stick things on screen. The goal is not to put with directed workflow is to is a linear. It's like you can go forward, you can go backward. Maybe you can make a choice and go one of two different directions off that screen. But it's not like a CRM where every button's on the screen. The biggest issue with screen real estate is you can't put all the buttons on the screen. It's why it's like imagine Nick's hamburger meatball Harry Harry meatball menu uh, with like a thing and then a thing and then it's like. 12 different items that spawn off of sub menus. He hasn't done that. Um, if he does, you guys need to tell him to stop. 
right? Because he doesn't listen to me. He only listens to you. But yeah, it, he, <laughs> the issue is that you want to limit what's on screen to make the screen understandable, I think is the operative idea. Uh, we're, we're, so from the real estate angle, you want to limit what's on screen to make it understandable. At a most basic level, you've got a forward and a backwards button. Where you put the forward and backwards button can either be at the top or on the left and the right in the middle or at the bottom, right? Um, let's see. Let's take a look at the next screen. So they have a list view. See the back button right there? Apple sticks it high and left as their back button. So you could have a back button that way, and then a forward button would be something else you'd select in flight, right? Uh, uh, talks about mobility and, and focus and things like that. So once again, managing the focus, right? Managing the focus, making sure that people don't get lost in what you're trying to do. Kind of covers all this, right? Once again, designing, um, yeah, navigation. Yeah, here we go. Ah, here we go. Hierarchical navigation, flat navigation. So it is right here. Here it is. This is the stuff we're talking about. So... This is open-ended, non-directed navigation. Flat navigation, this is directed workflow. Forward, backwards. And they can't just wander all over everywhere, right? Um, and so this one's a little bit non-directed. Provi always provide a clear path, right? Blah, blah, blah. So Apple calls it flat navigation versus higher, uh, or high, or hierarchical. It's actually flat, kind of sideways. Uh, Content-driven or experience-driven navigation. Um, actually, all these are directed to a, a level because you have to sequence through them. Um, if you had a navigation where it's one spider in the middle and you can go everywhere, that is what you don't want. But it's how we build, if you've been building FileMaker solutions, it's how you build a solution historically, especially on a, on a larger computer screen because you have the room to put all the buttons. Hey, put this button here and this button there and this button there. There's room for all that. With a with a with a phone, you have such limited amounts of rules, right? Actually, it's so funny that that this is right here. It's covered right here. This is this is so funny that we just run into this. Apple. So what Apple's saying is that as you do a directed workflow, they don't use that word, but we have workflow um, that they you have a hierarchical or a flat one, or a content-driven one, kind of. This is kind of getting a little loose and fast, but what you, you're, the goal is that you're trying to get people to the end over here coherently, and you make them go through the process of, of doing everything they need to do, okay? Whatever that is. Every business process will be different. Every last one is different, okay? Um, and, and if you have a bunch of highly motivated people that work in your company and they care about the organization stuff like that this is less of an issue because they're going to want to do the right thing for the right reason in general um and they they will feel you will have people who will feel hammed in and constricted for example i'm a pilot a helicopter pilot versus an airline transport pilot airline transport guys have very boring lives in my limited opinion right because they have one they have they start in a place and they already know a month in advance where they're going to go and they don't get to decide about it at all unless the engine falls off they get in the plane and they go from point a to point b then point b to point c and it's very linear experience it's very boring and and, and i met the pilots who do this and they they're thrilled with it me on the other hand i i would quit after about two weeks because I want to be able to have free-flowing exercise. That's why FileMaker is so great, because it allows you create the creatively express yourself by building solutions for people. That's why flying a helicopter is great, because when I take off and I land, I never almost land the same way twice exactly, because A, I'm not supposed to land the way the planes do. I'm supposed to land a different way. It's said in the regulations that way. So I'm supposed to avoid the planes. And so that means... All I have to do is avoid the planes and not endanger anyone, and I can do whatever the hell I want, which is pretty awesome, right? So it gives you that flexibility to express yourself, right? So um, some people like and want linear existence. Some people will feel handcuffed and bored by that, like the dog choker on the dog. They'll feel bored and constrained and constricted because I can only do go forward or go backwards. You have a highly creative person. They don't want to tell them. You, oh, you can only, we go to Nick. You, Nick, you only have, 
you know, in your whole interface. Actually, Nick is pretty hamstrung with FileMaker as is, but imagine you took half the half the design elements away on the interface. What would Nick do? The guy would explode, and then he would quit, and he would go and work on something else. Okay. <laughs> Uh, so when building OS resolution, single emphasize size. Yeah, so Mark talks about the size issue, constraint issue. I'm talking broader than that because, once again, every time, if I try to say, give you folks rules, A, most of you will resent the rules, and B, the other half of you who don't resent the rules would find a, a moment where the rule doesn't apply. I'm trying to give you general guidelines on this. So let me go back to Discord. Yeah, these are some of the screen real estate sizes. Um, it, it used to be in the old days when you were building in FileMaker, you could go into layout mode and you would say, oh, I want to see the stencils. So over here are the stencils, right? See the stencils? And you say, I want to see the stencil for, it would say iPhone 3, landscape, iPhone 3, uh, portrait, iPhone 4, iPhone 5, and the list was like long. Now it's like, hey, pfft, you figure out what the hell you want. Because not only do we have a, a ton of iPhones and iPads and iPad minis and iPad Maxes and iPad Jumbos, uh, and then you got all the Android devices too. I mean, all sorts of things. And so you have to kind of figure out your screen. Apple, because Claris is part of Apple, they, they take the time to give us the dimensions on their devices right here. But yeah, it's uh, it's it's directed workflow it just used to be about, it was such a simple concept, but you, you have a small screen and you can't fit all the <laughs> on the screen. So first, the first thing you do is you think about 80% of your users only need 20% of the features. So you take the 80% of the features they don't need and you remove them. And then do you do you have still have enough screen real estate to, to, to do what you need to do? And the answer is sometimes no, in which case what you do is you create directed workflow so the buttons you need on the screen are forward and backwards, not contacts, accounts, invoices, project, blah, 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 blah. And even if you do a hamburger menu, it pops there and then it scrolls down the thing and your thing is going up and down, right? So... Um, yeah, so you get this issue of screen real estate, and then you also have the issue which Jobs talked about is people who do it the old way, because that's the way they did it back in 1912, and they rode the Pony Express to work, and they <laughs> walked to school uphill both ways, <laughs> bare feet and five feet of snow, right? Yeah. Um, and I get that. I get that. I get that. Uh, but it's if if they don't behave, you have directed workflow needs to be in your tool. Your, your tool house, right? If you if you do build solutions for people and those people fundamentally don't behave and you have a mandate to make the data accurate and correct or they blame you, then directed workflow better be a tool in your tools. And just think about it. What is the work? What is the process? Then build a screen. Screen one, next screen. Screen two, screen three. It's kind of like the sliders that you have, the little dot sliders on the on the on the interface, except that you can jump between the sliders. So you really don't. You could use the sliders, but you don't want to show the sliders because you want to script the next, the go forward process and the back process, because if you script it, then you can do checks to make sure that the person finished the stuff they were on on the screen before going to the next window. What was the criteria for that, right? What was the criteria? Ruben, what was the criteria? Yes. There was kind of like a comment earlier from Mark, I don't know if we really discussed, but he mentioned specifically like lazy employees, where mm -hmm. people like, if they don't see the bright, shiny thing immediately, it's like kind of roll over and give up. Well, How that's for people that? like that. They're not going to, if you give them a, a starting point interface, remember, a starting point is a starting point. It could never be complete point because everyone's business processes are different. I mean, let's be clear about this. If you buy a Taco Bell McDonald's franchise, there's a established process you will follow or they will take your franchise from you. When you buy Taco Bell franchise, are one of the most expensive franchises because they make so much money. Um, the products are pretty high, uh, high margin products because um, how hard is it to throw beans and a tortilla, right? It's pretty easy. Um, and and so I remember 10, 15 years ago, one of the, uh, the Claris reps, but he was a really great guy. I love him. I would talk to him. I haven't talked to him in a couple months, but he um, was looking at buying a Taco Bell franchise. $450,000 worth of, uh, just to get the license, four hundred half a million bucks to get just the license, never mind to buy the store, the building, all the materials, the literature to train the people. To get a Taco Bell uh, 
store running would probably be three million bucks or something easy that was 10 15 years ago this was like 2005 so anyway but the franchises uh are very cookie cutter when you buy that license you're they give you the secret manuals or pdfs now whatever they were probably binders and manuals step one and step two if you ever sit go around behind the counters those of you who worked at fast food and up on the up on the walls while the customers can't see is a graphical checklist of how you make a burrito tortilla bean one one scoop of scoop number one bean to do this bean to do that wrap it up and the thing it's very cookie cutter It's a cookie cutter process it's non-negotiable okay but that's why it's so great because you know the process outside of that every business you're going to deal with has its own custom processes every business and 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 as a business person who is a creative person a lot of your creative people you love that create a better business process deliver better things to the customer you love a challenge like that most of you who are here love that right if you don't love that i'm surprised you like filemaker filemaker is the ultimate tool for you the swiss army knife to solve the business problem it's it's really great. It's why we use the platform the way we do. But there are times that we have to devolve ourselves, put on the handcuffs, lock us away, because we have to have people follow the process on how to make a burrito. What started off years ago as purely a screen real estate issue has become an issue where you need to be able to manage the customers to make sure they finish the process correctly. And if you have if you have staff and employees, and you'll always have that, you're not, not everyone in your organization are going to be a performers. Jobs talked about that at great length about the people who made the first Mac. They were extraordinarily highly motivated a performers. They would go back and yell at each other in meetings that they sucked, and they would they would force them. They wouldn't get mad and pissed off. They'd go back and do a better job until one day they got to the point where there was a great product. And they all signed the inside of the cases. Right? It was amazing. And so. Um, yeah, I take a lot of pride in building something great, but then you're, but not everyone's going to be like that. If you have a customer or they're in your own team and they're not following the rules, you're going to have to direct, create directed workflow to manage their uh, what they output. So what they output is a value to the organization and not a detriment to the organization. So that's about it for now. Any other questions we have? Right, uh, tomorrow is going to be an opposite of today. So yesterday was like technic. Today is like big picture processing, keeping some uh, tools on hand to help you with customers that are wayward or small screens. And then tomorrow is performance on, uh, if I'm not mistaken, tomorrow is performance on uh, server. So with Nick Hanza, uh, FileMaker performance uh, 19.4, right? Mostly focused on pro go to server performance. Um, he might talk about WebDirect, I don't really know. So Margaret, are you gonna be up the bat on that one tomorrow? Yes. Uh, are you coming? I will be there. I will be there for that, but you can run it uh, since we're still reporting internet problems here. Although I got green lights here, much it's more. It's going universal. back and forth. Like I'm watching it on my screen. It's going like yellow and then green, then yellow and then green. Like okay. it gets good, and okay. then it like wanders off. Yeah. Well, that's why we're going to up the uh, outbound uh, data rate out of this office on uh, Monday. So what yeah. we'll do is t tomorrow and Friday we'll switch to Santa uh, to Reno, and then we'll go from there. Mm -hmm. Um, let us know if you have topic ideas or topic suggestions. A lot of times yeah. we go back and cover things we've already covered before, um, and we're happy but to answer questions. questions. It's yeah. always great. I collect those like religiously. Like I've got a little database of them. So yeah. anyone who wants to vomit ideas, are like, oh, it'd be cool if RCC did this. Cool. But obviously, no promises. People have asked for stuff that we don't have engineers that do anything with. But yep. we store yep. them anyway, just yep. in case. Just in case. XSLT. Uh, we have to find someone at RC who does a lot of that. We would bring them in on that, right? Uh, that's those are Excel style sheets, right? Or or XML style sheets, I think. So yeah, uh, most of my folks are doing JSON at this point with that. So, all right, cool. Well, that's it for today. Appreciate it. Make sure you send comments. Uh, if you post them here, it's fine. But if you definitely want the comment to be seen or acted upon, suggestion or question, send an email to support support at r cconsulting.com
Mm -hmm. I've got a report of an individual up here who uh, may be a FileMaker license. Uh, well, it's potentially expired. Look at the back of that car right there. Looks like the FileMaker license has expired. Sir, I need you to step out of the vehicle. Sir, sir, step out of the vehicle. Sir. Oh, yeah.